I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. And uh, just so that everybody knows, if you came on late and you you weren't hearing that uh, hearing, um, I will be sharing my screen. But there's people watching the chat room, so if you have a question, a comment, something you want to add, we we can make this interactive. I've got a lot of good information I want to share, but I want to hear from you too. So uh, you should feel free to. Um, just chat, put up the chat and they'll bring it up to me. So I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint uh, because I want us to look at uh, a few of these, the slides that I have uh, and we'll get ourselves started here. Can you turn that down, please? All right, my husband's in the other room watching TV. Yes. Uh, so we're going to look at caring, healing, and resiliency during the pandemic. But really the things we're going to be talking about during the pandemic are things that we can take over to other areas of our life because the pandemic has uh, changed things for us or maybe brought things forward. So the outbreak of the virus exposed really what we'd say were, I'd say, cracks uh, in the system of where uh, we were vulnerable and a fragile global community. This was a worldwide phenomena. Uh, the first time that we've had a pandemic of this sort in a hundred years. So we're really living an experience that a lot of people, well, everybody alive today has not had before. Uh, and so uh, it's new and we weren't sure how to deal with it. And I think we heard people say another pandemic was coming, coming, but it never came and people were not expecting it to happen. And when it happened so swiftly and so fast, it really changed our feeling of safety within the world because nobody was quite sure uh, what we were doing. Um, our thoughts got taken up with our own loved ones, uncertainty about work for many of you, work and school, but for sure school, where are we gonna be in class? Are we gonna be out of class? We're learning from home. Uh, part of the experience of university is the people you meet, the relationships you form. And here we were in a year where we may not be able to connect with anybody. Uh, people were rightfully, and maybe many of you concerned with their own personal health. You know, would I get COVID? What would happen if I got COVID? Uh, and even though they kept telling us that really it was a, it was a disease that most impacted the elderly, uh, we have grandparents, we have people we love in that age category, but they also kept saying, we don't know for sure how it will impact any one person. So there was a lot of anxiety, if you will, right from the beginning about what tomorrow will bring. And in fact, here we are uh, a year later and we're still... Uh, sort of in the same place, although with the vaccines coming, we at least see some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, my daughter was to get married at the very beginning of May last year, uh, and we were at five people in the church and no one could gather, and so she canceled the wedding earlier on than that. We knew things were not gonna open up. And I said to her, probably by June, we'll be able to have something. Uh, but June was coming and uh, it wasn't changing, so she got married with five people in the church by Zoom, and she went and had a driveway visit with all the family members that night. So it was a very different wedding as she planned, uh, but in the end, it was a great day, and she actually quite enjoyed it. So we were under new stresses that we hadn't dealt with before, and they were adding to the everyday stresses that we all have and we all experience basically uh, uh, <laughs> on any given day. So the impacts of the stress can and did overwhelm some of us, and maybe on some days we are more overwhelmed than other days. Uh, and they can these stresses, these these unknowns that are bothering us, show up in our lives in different ways. Sometimes in ways that we're not uh, expecting. And so the first sort of step in the whole process, I think, of understanding how to deal with the stresses is understanding what goes on in our bodies as we're going through stress so that we can recognize it and know that there's actually uh, something that's happening within us that we can control given the right tools uh, by that. And I like this saying before we get into that part, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. And so in a way, uh, Maya Angelou is, is trying to remind us that, yes, things change us, uh, good, bad, and different things change us, but it doesn't have to reduce us. We can learn from it, we can remain strong, we can become resilient. And so that's the sort of the starting premise we're gonna go with as we go through here. 
So first, we have to understand the nervous system uh, because knowing the biology, uh, and it'll be quick, knowing the biology helps us to deal with our own feelings and our responses and what's going on and why they're going on. And I think that's important. Uh, the sympathetic branch of our uh, nervous system, so we have two, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Don't worry about all the little writing there because it's, it's small, but it's just to show you that there's a lot going on in our bodies at any given time. Uh, the sympathetic system, uh, it prepares us in a sense for issues. It increases our heart rate. It increases our, our breathing. So we breathe faster. Well, you've all felt that if you're afraid of something or someone jumps out at you instantly, you get that extra breath, the heart's pounding, all of those kinds of things. Digestion is slowed because blood flows to the limbs uh, and the blood vessels, uh, in order to make that happen, we constrict to take blood away from skin and muscles. And that's why when someone gets really shocked or really bad news, you'll see people will say, oh, they went white as a ghost. Because the response to that massive stress is for the body to protect the organs that we need and to get you, in a sense, prepared uh, to, um, to run if you need to, to respond. So the sympathetic system... You might call it the gas pedal of the body. Uh, it gets us going, if you will. The parasympathetic system is, in a sense, the opposite. It helps us to relax. It keeps our body from being overburdened all the time. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system reduces our heart rate. It loosens our muscles. Uh, it reduces our breathing. Our hands and feet warm up again uh, so that we can engage and connect and our brain is more relaxed and able to take in information and respond and discern what should happen. So we cycle in and out of these all day, little stresses and big stresses. There's no question about it. But our our bodies are, it's always looking to settle in the parasympathetic because the sympathetic system pushing on the gas pedal, everything's going in the body, cortisol, adrenaline, lots of things that are tough on the system. And so it's not good for the heart and the lungs to be in that hyper state. So our body's always trying to bring us back by using the parasympathetic system uh, to get us kind of relaxed. So uh, you see the sympathetic system there again. It's the one that gets us going, makes us respond, allows us to engage when something happens that we need to respond to quickly or, or gets us angry. And the parasympathetic brings us down into that sort of softer place where we can uh, rationally think about things. Every person has a window of tolerance, as you're seeing there. And in that window is the stresses that I can deal with. Uh, everyone has a different level of stress they can deal with. Uh, and for some people, it's a very small amount. And when you add to that, they start to feel anxiety. They start to feel pressure in their chest, all those kinds of things. Other people can take on all kinds of stress before they get to that point. The important thing is, is that the two systems are within your body. Much of it is genetic, and we can't control our body's response, but we control what we ask our body to respond to. So we bring ourselves into that parasympathetic system, if you will. So the amount of stress that each individual person can handle depends on, uh, you know, your personality, how you were raised, maybe the things you were, were taught in terms of dealing with stress. Do we ignore it? Don't we ignore it? Uh, and so what we really want is to keep ourselves in that window of being able to cope. When we notice ourselves getting out of that, when we notice things happening that are telling us the stresses are getting to be too much, it's time to step back and say, what do I need to do to make sure I can cope? And that's the resilience that's happening now. We shouldn't be out of the window because the window is too hard. So what does that look like? Well, too much, too fast is too difficult when it comes to stress. And you'll see some of the words there uh, that, you know, pressure, we feel headaches, we feel sadness, depression. There's all kinds of things, anxiety, that our body tells us too much of the, the sympathetic system is happening. I'm on the go too much. The gas pedal is being pushed to the floor and the body's having a hard time relaxing you. And so we shouldn't ignore those things um, because, again, those things will impact us negatively, physically, emotionally, mentally, and ultimately spiritually. And so we don't want to be in that place uh, where things are going to be challenging for us.
So what's happening during stress? Important just quickly to know. So the frontal cortex of our brain, which you see lit up there, is the thinking center of the brain. Uh, and the thinking center of the brain tells you, in a sense, how to deal with things, how to think about things, how to be rational about what's happening. When we are in the sympathetic part of our body, when our body is responding through the sympathetic nervous system, our frontal cortex has less blood flowing to it. And so the energy that would go to that is going to other parts of the brain like that allow us to move quickly and respond quickly. And so we can't often rationally think. That's why if someone is grieving, we will often sort of break down things into very small pieces or perhaps yourself if you're studying you'll say okay I can't study for all of these at once I'm going to do one subject and then another we break it down to sort of relax ourselves and so too much detail is stressful for somebody that's under stress uh, and so if you're helping somebody that's under stress it's very good to break it down for them to be gentle in your approach and not give too much. Well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. That adds to the stress and they're like, oh, I can't do any of that. We might just want to mention, have you tried this? Why don't you try this? And the next day we'll mention something else. So this whole response of the sympathetic system puts us into a position where we would, and you'll have heard two of them, the fight or, or flight so I'm ready to go or I'm ready to run. But we now know from science and studying the brain and doing imaging that really what we do in that response, we have fight, flight, or freeze. And very often freeze is the one that many of us get caught up in. And so we freeze. Freezing is like having your foot on the gas pedal and the brake pedal at the same time. So the whole body's revving up, but the whole body is trying to stop you. And so we've got this gunning going back and forth, and it's not good for us or for the body. So um, when we don't have time to discharge all that cortisol, adrenaline, all that's built up in our body with stress, when the parasympathetic system can't release it and get rid of it, it gets stuck in the system and we get overburdened with it. Our body is on the hypervigilant state, a high state, if you will. And, and that's when we can crash because the body has so much happening within it at one time. And so um, we would call what happens when it's a, the freeze situation where we're having both things happening at once. There's all kinds of stress coming at us that our sympathetic system is a deregulated system. The parasympathetic, which relaxes us, isn't able to relax us from the sympathetic. So they're both in overdrive, trying, 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 and the body, in essence, gets tired. There's, there's this hyper and hypo, up and down arousal, and the person, because of that, we feel crazy, we're, get, we're trying to get everything done, and then, oh, I'm so tired, I can't do it, I am, and then I can't do it. So I, I begin to feel numb and maybe passive and we can start disconnect from our own feelings and from other people. During the COVID virus, there was an extra challenge to this stress because very often we can talk to people that are close to us, in front of us, and have developed a relationship with. But many times COVID separated from us, uh, from our friends. We weren't able, maybe by Zoom, maybe FaceTiming, maybe you know, various other social medias, but not quite the same as having somebody there uh, for us. And so a lot of people were finding they were getting into this sort of hyperdrive uh, system. Uh, and so what we have to do is recognize when we're in that and find ways to help ourselves before we get there. So this fight, flight, or freeze, either one of, it, none of them are good ways to deal with stress. Because we're not thinking properly, frontal cortex isn't getting the amount of blood it needs. And so we don't engage if we should, as we should with people. Uh, and we never solve the problems and the stress just builds up because of it. So relationship is the key to safety for all people. It should make sense to those of us who are people of faith. Uh, because anyone who is a person of faith understands that God made us to be relational. And therefore, what will make us feel best is being in relation. And one of the things I know, uh, and, and you know, I might mention it again later, is that 
now in your group here at McMaster uh, with Paul and with Father, you always have someone you can speak to, always someone in relationship with, uh, including your friends, of course, but they're always there for you. And that's a good thing to engage in. When you start to just feel things going up, don't say, oh, I'll just put it, I'll just get through it. Just say, you know what? I'm overwhelmed right now. There's lots happening and I just, I just need to talk about it for a few minutes. Letting it out verbally is almost like bursting the balloon and letting air out slowly. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we do. So the key uh, is to build safe relationships where we can let uh, these anxieties and these issues and these stresses out. So I just want to take a second before I talk about some of the things you might do. Uh, is to say to you, these are some of the ways that you might engage with someone who is stressed if a friend comes to you. But of course, they can also help you uh, to think about them in this way. So first, and as we've talked about, engage socially with the person. Don't talk about the issues because that can pile, pile stress up, especially we find for men. Women are more likely to de-stress from talking about an issue. Men get re-stressed when they talk about an issue. So how's the weather? How are your holidays? You know, how are you finding learning at home? Something that's, you know, just not about the issue maybe at hand. Uh, we want to slow the pace, talk slowly, sort of chunk information, because as we slow the pace ourselves, as we relax the conversation ourselves, we are activating um, our own nervous system and human beings sort of ping off each other. And you've probably experienced it yourself. You've walked into a room where there's a lot of stress and you don't even know what's going on, but you feel it. And that stress goes to you and you and you and you. So if you're the person helping someone, it's important to try to stay calm and then have this a grounded presence again so that you're slow, you're calm. It's not a good idea for you to be the one talking to a person if you're really stressed yourself. Uh, and that last one there, tracking the person, you know, are they really talking fast? Are they crying? Are they over anxious? Uh, in that particular case, we need to step back from talking about the issue that's bothering them for the moment and go back to number one and just say, why don't we, uh, if, if you're on Zoom, why don't we both go get a cup of tea and, and we'll come back and chat keep your Zoom on, come back with your tea. It relaxes for a minute. You get the tea. What kind of tea you're drinking? Oh, I take milk in mine. Just a mundane conversation allows the parasympathetic system to step in, allows the frontal cortex to start thinking, and allows the body uh, to de-stress. Um, anybody want to share anything? Anybody that's uh, online or any of the people, you can put it in the chat room here and uh, we can uh, share any comments where you've experienced this or help someone and see that it works. Does it make sense to you? Anybody commenting, my people that are looking? Not yet. Perhaps they're typing furiously away. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll continue on. Please feel free. Uh, it's good for you to be able to interact a little bit. Uh, so questions that can help to build resiliency when you're helping another person. So what's helping you get through this moment when they tell you how bad it is? They're obviously talking about it, so they're trying to work through it. What's helping you get through? They might say, well, you know, I take... I, take that cup of tea or I try to take a bath or I go for a walk or something. And so you're going to encourage them. You might also ask them, who are your supports? Who are the people that you could talk to? Could you talk to your mom and dad? Could you talk to your siblings? Do you have a friend who's close by that's in your bubble these days? Um, but even Zoom and phone works. So you want to remind them that there are people. Sometimes when we feel overwhelmed, we start to forget that there are people. And as I mentioned, uh, in Paul and in Father, you've got people right there all the time that are happy to help you and speak with you. So you're never alone in that regard if you need supports. And so you can remind people of that. But even in asking them who are their supports, it's something, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not alone after all. I do have people. And then the last one is a real important one for ourselves and for other people. So these questions are good for yourself, but they're good if you're trying to support someone. What's helped you get through stressful times in the past? Because sometimes you say, yeah, there was a time I thought everything was going crazy and, you know, I wasn't really going to be able to handle it. And then suddenly 
uh, this happened or I did this and things were better. I took that bath. I went for that walk. I, I did whatever. Uh, uh, adult coloring is becoming a great stress reliever because we focus just on the coloring. Journaling is a great stress reliever because when we put it on paper, we take it out of our body. And so there's lots of ways that we might uh, reduce our stress, if you will. Uh, and we might suggest to someone else um, that they can do that. A good indicator for anyone, yourself or someone you're supporting, uh, when they're too stressed or overstressed is their breathing. So it's a good indicator to know how they're doing and how you're doing. If I'm, if the breath is slowing down, if I'm, I'm breathing fairly calmly, it means the parasympathetic system is jumping into gear uh, and they're going to be more relaxed. So when I'm calm and I feel safe, I don't feel tense and my breath slows down. So all good indicators. So two days from the Dalai Lama. There are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. Today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. It's a beautiful saying in essence uh, of what we're called to do is to, to live the day. What opportunities do we have today? What can I do today? Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking I should have done this. I should have done that. We, we stress ourselves out and we can't change it. Uh, we can learn from it, but we can't change it. Uh, and then sometimes we spend a lot of time. In fact, experts say far too much time. That's a lot of why we have so much anxiety, thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow or in the future. And people are saying now with the pandemic, when's it going to be over? When are we going to be able to see friends? When are we going to be able to travel? And all of that heightens anxiety instead of saying, today I'm going to call my grandmother and have a chat with her because today I can do and I know what I can do today. So it's it's a really good one uh, to think about uh, because when we stay in the moment and we seek support for the moment and how we feel for the moment, it goes a long way to reducing our stress. Uh, and so um, again, you have a perfect place to vent on the day that you need that through your McMaster student group here. Uh, and it can help you feel right in today. And if you feel good today, tomorrow's going to be better. So you won't have to worry uh, as much about it. Helen Keller said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And so very important. It's our fundamental belief as Catholics uh, that God is with us. Uh, we may have other people on who are, are from other faiths, or maybe no faith at all, but we all have a sense of something greater than ourselves. In terms of those of us that are Catholic, we have a, fun, a, a foundational belief that God is with us. We know that God died on the cross or in the Lenten season and the resurrection happened. And so we always have hope for better. We know that there is hope and God is with us. Uh, and that can help us uh, through the, the moments, if you will. Uh, and to also the important piece of this quote is to know that sometimes when we get feeling stressed, we begin to focus inward and we stop looking outward. And when we're looking inward, we tend to think we're the only ones having this stress. I'm the only one with five papers due, two exams. I can't believe I've got to work this weekend. I can't even believe it. This is all happening. I don't have enough money to pay the last month's rent. And on and on. And we begin to focus on what's happening in our world, which is important to do, except that we then feel burdened. It's only me. And it, there is something about... Um, we feel a little bit better, it's terrible to say, when well, we know everybody's suffering a little bit. And so again, speaking to people lets you know you're not alone, even though people might not be experiencing exactly what you're speaking. So what does healing look like? What does healing look like if I'm going to try to improve, if you will, my lot? I feel stress, I feel that uh, heartbeat going up, my breathing, I feel a tightness in my chest, maybe I'm getting headaches tightness in the back, the body will tell you before the mind tells you that you're under too much stress. Uh, the body will tell you because that sympathetic system, all of that cortisol, adrenaline, and the other things that are in your body will start to have an impact. So when you feel tightness in the chest, the back, a headache, whatever it is that tells you things are getting to be too much, 
it's very important to stop then and step back so that you don't get into that moment when the gas pedal and the brake pedal are both pressing and causing you to be overwhelmed to the point where you can't cope with it. So here's what to do when you begin to feel uh, those bodily uh, um, challenges, those bodily hints that you're getting to be uh, under stress. Sometimes um, we, we don't know until we start to feel those things. We're just living our lives. Everything seems to be good. And suddenly, wham, we start to feel all of these physical um, uh, physical challenges within our body. And we should stop and say, what's happening? So we have to help ourselves. That's the most important thing that we can. We have to make a decision to change how we're interacting with, who we're interacting with, or what it is in our life that is challenging us. Now, your students, you have exams coming up. You'd like to say, I'm sorry, I'm feeling stressed. We can't have exams. I'm not going to do them. Except the professors will say, well, then you'll get zero. So you can't control all of that. But you could say, listen, I've got a lot of exams coming up. I'm going to start chunking my time now. I'm not going to wait till the night before to study. Uh, there's things that I can do to control uh, this this preparing for exams, I'll ask a friend to help me. There's a part of the course I don't understand. I'm going to make an appointment with the professor. So we can make decisions that will change how the life is impacting us um, instead of just letting it unfold and act like we have nothing that can do, uh, that can help us. Maybe more important than anything else, and this can be a challenging one for us at times, because often when we're stressed, uh, we naturally go to things that make our brain feel better. Uh, sweets, carbohydrates, chips, and things like that. We eat kind of junk food because it makes us feel better for a moment. We get a high in the brain because of the, what happens in the produ uh, processing of the food, but then we get a pretty big down. So it's not that any of those things are bad, but the old story of eating right, the body is designed, God designed us in a perfect way, we eat the right food, uh, we exercise, we, we look after our emotional well-being by talking to people, by socializing, etc. cetera, uh, then we begin to feel better. So it's taking one small step at a time. Uh, we're not going to tomorrow start running five miles, eating only good food, and all of those kinds of things. But we can say, tomorrow I'm going to eat some fruit because it's good for me. And I'm going to try to get enough sleep. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a commitment to myself that instead of going to bed at 2 and getting up at 6, I'm going to go to bed at 11 and get up at 6 and see what a difference that does. So we have to try. Life is about choices. There's no question. Every moment of every day we make choices to be active or inactive, uh, to decide to eat right or not eat right. And so we can, we can make a choice to start the process uh, going. So... What you're looking at there are, are words that lessen stress. Uh, and you can see them uh, as well as I can there. So there's lots of things we can purposely do uh, to uh, allow stress to be reduced uh, for us. So take a look at the words uh, and, and see which ones jump out at you. Take a moment just to say to yourself, which ones do I think would help me to reduce my stress? I know that people are on mute, but maybe you want to just type into the box which words stood out for you, and we can uh, read a few of those and see uh, which, if there's a common uh, a few that, that pop out for people. I know from, uh, from previously, people were mentioning going on walks with friends, like seeing them in person, even if it's socially distanced, going on walks, getting tea, uh, like bubble teas, like that. Uh, yeah. writing. <clears throat> I know a couple of um, friends who are in a very uh, sort of stressful situation at the moment and you know they took uh, an evening and they just went out into the yard and made a snowman right so that's play here, yeah. right? just taking that time to sort of get back and sort of touch on um, yep. the fun things right to sort of step yes. away from the problems that they're having. Yes it, one Getting thing grandchildren do for me. Yeah I've got a bunch of uh, instances in the chat here so pray and create seem to be um, ones that people are uh, going to laugh, it <laughs> shows up a bunch. Um, laugh is yeah. me medicine for the soul. Laughter is medicine for the soul, for sure. Hope, trust, connect. Yeah. So you see with all the different words, and, and if we ask every person to write which one stood out for you first, 
it's different for every person. But in this little slide, if you've got phones, take a little picture of it uh, because and maybe I can send the slide and you can send it out, Paul. You can look at that when you're when you're starting to feel stressed and say, what, what one of these can I do right now? to help me lessen that stress, to put me back in the window where I'm managing. Because we have stresses every day, but sometimes we're getting outside of them. And the addition of COVID is one of those things that has put us into already high stress because we're worried about other people, worried about ourselves, we're wondering if it's going to end. And now we have school and finances and other things to contend with as well. So we're putting two together and maybe it's pulling us outside of our window. Uh, and so these things can pull us uh, back into our window. Teresa, oh, it's Mr. Yes. Mary. Hi. Yes. When you were saying about uh, making choices and control, I joined a workshop years ago and it said that really in life, we only can control 7% of our life, of, of what's happening in the world, our lives, everything. But we don't even do that 7%. Place. Yes. That there's so much possibility out there if we if we recognized it and could access it and see the potential of it. But absolutely. So yeah. There is so much potential and possibility, but we don't always see it. We don't always see it. We don't think about the things that we do have control over. So we start to feel out of control. So, you know, we can control how much sleep we get, what we eat, what we wear, who we talk to, uh, how much we study, how we study. We, as you're saying, you know, we can't control that there's exams. That's part of going to school. But we can control how we deal with those exams. So uh, you're right. It's a, it's a balancing act. But we often don't. Uh, we don't take those opportunities to... Uh, to take control. Uh, and so um, here's a few, uh, we, we don't have a lot of time today, so you're getting the, over, the, broad, the broad view, but here's a few things that you can take constructive action. Um, looking at emotions, your attitudes, and your actions again. How am I viewing this? How am I taking it in? Uh, and in the other slide, there was one about gratitude. Might I focus more on what I have as opposed to what I don't have? So we can constructively do that. We can use I messages with what we feel when we're speaking uh, and um, not make accusations to people. I know you don't care. Instead saying, I feel like I need more support. Uh, and very often people will say, absolutely. People want to help. So I messages are always the best way to gain what we need. Personal happiness is personal, just like those words were. And so think about what are those moments, what are those things, what are those times that make you happy? Uh, and as Paul said, going for a walk with a friend, then let's schedule a walk every second day if we can't do it every day. Let's put it into the agenda and make sure we get those moments. Um, we can have hope and confidence that we can resolve conflict and work towards sort of these solutions and know that we can reach out to people uh, we've been talking here about this group here, the members of the group, maybe other friends, to Father, to Paul, uh, all of it, and um, Mary maybe, is, is Mary helping too at the parish? So that would be another person that would be happy to help, uh, you can reach out to. So um, it's important that we think about uh, those that we love and care about, uh, and they care for us, and that ultimately they're on the same page as us. We all want what's best for each other. So together, we can say, how do we cope with this situation, if you will? So know what your basic needs are. These are the basic needs of all human beings. We all need love because we were created in love by God to love, to love God and to love those in our lives. So we need love. And I'm not talking here about a sexual intimate love, although that's a special kind of love that most people uh, move towards eventually. I'm talking about love within our lives where we feel cared for, safe, confident, and we know that the person genuinely cares for us. We do have a need uh, for freedom in a sense. And freedom doesn't mean we can do whatever we want because none of us can, um, but it is a need to feel free to express what we need, express what we think, express what we desire. Uh, and if we have people around us who don't allow us that freedom of speaking, of being who we are, then we need to say, maybe these people aren't the best for me. Because when people take away our freedom to think, to be who we are, we then begin to feel stressed and put upon. 
all of us need the feel the need to be significant. The important thing in life that we know is that every single human being is important because they are with a period. That's God's definition. You're important because you exist. He loves you. He cares for you because you exist. But often we don't talk to God enough. And so we start to feel that maybe we're not important enough, that we should do more, that we should be more. When in fact, we need to, for ourselves, think about what is it that I want to desire to do, desire to be? What is it that makes me happy? We have to look after ourselves before we start looking after other people. So we all do need to be significant to someone and to maybe something that we do in our lives. But that can be very different for every human being. So it takes some time for us to think about and know, when do I feel at my best? Is it helping people? Is it planting in the garden? Is it creating uh, clothing? Uh, is it a food drive that I run? What, what will make me feel that I'm contributing, uh, but also that I am um, able and capable to do it? And then we have the need for recreation. We talked about walking. The body is designed to move. God made us uh, our, our human bodies in such a beautiful way that everything works better when we move. We feel better. We sleep better. We can learn better. Uh, the body is meant to move and get that blood flowing. So uh, we need recreation away from studying, away from work, away from the commitments of life. And for some people, that may just be reading. It may not even be physical activity, but we need something that is relaxing to us. Uh, and the last is we need the need for peace with God. We need to be able to have conversations with God, to pray to God, to know that God is there with us and that he will in the quiet moments uh, of our lives, if we take time to be quiet, he will through our hearts and our minds and maybe through others who he brings into our lives, gives us the answers that we need. So he's there with us. So these basic needs, when we meet them for ourselves, when we consciously meet them for ourselves, we feel better. The stresses don't um, overcome us as much as uh, they would. Got to keep an eye on my time here. because I, uh, I was going to go through these slides faster than I, I am. So, uh, so healing expectations, uh, things that we can do so that we feel better. The first one is accept people, including yourself, for who they are and what they're capable of. It goes back to the, the things we just talked about in the previous slide of what our needs are. Sometimes we are stressed by trying or trying to get people to be who they're not, or more importantly, expecting people to be who they're not. And then they let us down and we begin to feel stressed about that. So we have to know who people are and we have to accept it. And we just heard about the 7% control of our lives. Experts say that over our lifetime, from the time we are in our later teens, right through our lifetime, we change less than 5%. We're pretty well, a lot of, of how we respond to the world and what we're capable of is partly genetic, partly how we're raised, all of that kind of thing. And so we have to accept people for who they are. We feel stressed when people don't accept us. Uh, and then allow them and you uh, to grow uh, together and, uh, and to really, you know, um, improve if there's issues that need to be improved at a reasonable pace, you know. I want you to be able to do this for me. You want to do this for you. Uh, let's talk about it and let's go on. We need to encourage and support other people and ourselves uh, in our efforts. We need to say, I'm proud of myself that this week I went to bed four out of seven nights at a decent hour. We need to congratulate ourselves for that and feel good about it. Uh, and the last one uh, there, you know, great communication is a key ingredient to improving any relationship using an I message, telling people what I need, what I desire, telling them what I see in them that I think is a wonderful trait, how important they are to me because of something. Uh, and so great communication where I can express my own needs and desires uh, really helps. So we have uh, ways to manage stress uh, and prevent it from controlling you. You see again some of these things that are precious that can build up. Uh, and we do that with resilience. So I'll do this quickly. There's sort of seven principles of building resilience. Uh, many of them we've already talked about. Reaching out to others. Uh, persevere by being open-minded and flexible and accepting of others. Be realistically optimistic. 
optimistic. So don't look at the negative side. Don't look at the glass as half empty, but try to see the things that are good. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it allows you to generate positive feelings to think about um, how things in my life are actually good. What is good? What's contributing? It? What are the strengths that I have? What are the things that people are offering to me? Uh, maintaining perspective and not getting too far out uh, into the negative, which is often what we do. Stay in the day and in the moment what we know to be true. And so resilience is really these things here. Engagement, positivity, vitality, achievement, meaning, relationships. Again, look at the words and say, these are the things when I do them well, when I focus on them, when I attempt to do some of these things, it makes me resilient. So when stress comes and stress will come, then I'm able to deal with it. So this slide is the bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. So bending means I kind of sometimes go with the flow. I reach out when I'm not feeling too well. I don't feel that I have to be the strong one that can handle everything myself. I tell people what I need. I'm willing, if I will, to put myself out there uh, and to use some of these tools that we've been talking about tonight to lessen the stress. And with COVID adding a big layer of stress, it's even more important that we look for these moments of gratitude, of relationship, of understanding the good that I have in my life, the things that are contributing uh, to goodness, uh, if you will. Whoops, sorry, now something happened here. Uh, there. So we talked about these again, so I'm just really kind of going over them quickly as a wrap up here. Caring for yourself means physical care, sleep, exercise, and nutrition. Vitally important if we're going to manage small and big stresses in our life. Mental and emotional self-care. Very important that our self-talk not be negative. That we flip it around and say, what are the things I'm good at? What am I doing to help myself in this moment? Or what are the things I could do? Internal dialogue can be very destructive, uh, but it can also be very helpful. And so we have to try to make sure that our internal dialogue and our self-talk is positive. Uh, the third one is increase, increasing your personal awareness. Step back when you're drained. Recognize, as you see in number four, your body. It will tell you what it needs when you're feeling exhausted, when you're feeling those pains, when you're feeling angry inside, like you just want to yell at somebody. These are all signs that a lot of stresses are taking you outside your window, and you need to step back and say, which of these can I do? to manage the stress. Maybe take a few days off and maybe at this point in university because you're coming to exams, you're not able to take a few days off, but can you take an hour and just sit with a cup of tea and talk to a friend? Schedule more breaks instead of studying for eight hours straight. Uh, these are ways that we can, in fact, uh, you know, take control. Uh, maybe we're going to take some time in the quiet instead of maybe partying. Uh, one big one that I haven't touched on too much because we don't have too much time today, and that is social media is a proven anxiety builder. It's proven to add to people's depression. It's proven to add to their stress loads with the need to be connected. And so maybe you're going to give yourself a day or two each week where you take a break from social media but to help yourself. So resilience there is accepting um, your, yourself in a sense, uh, and you can, you can scream your way through it, or you can accept it and put something together that's going to work for you, and basically uh, is what this quote is saying. So courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is quiet, voiced at the end of the day saying, you will try again tomorrow. So resilience means uh, accepting ourselves and knowing uh, that through it we can uh, we can grow in a sense. Some of you may know the butterfly story, and I'm just going to tell it very quickly to end because I think it's a great story. We can sometimes say why do things happen to us or what why do we struggle because everybody struggles at some point. Uh, the butterfly story is this: there was a man who would sit at his kitchen table every morning, having his breakfast and his coffee, and out of sight of his kitchen window was a tree, and he saw that a caterpillar had built a cocoon uh, and the weight of the cocoon was actually coming and sort of touching down on his window seal. And so he watched every day and he was waiting for the butterfly to emerge from the cocoon. Uh, and uh, one day 
he saw a little slit in the cocoon and he could see a little fluttering inside and he knew that it was getting time for this butterfly to arrive. So he was watching very intently. He wanted to not miss the butterfly that he'd been seeing in the cocoon for so long. He wanted to see it before it flew away and he might not see it again. So he watched, but the butterfly seemed to be struggling. He didn't seem to be able to get the cocoon open. And the man was afraid that if he didn't intervene, that the, the butterfly might die. So he went out with a knife and he very carefully slit the cocoon so that the butterfly could come out. And it did come out and plopped onto his window seal. And he saw that the body was a little bit shriveled up and the wings were not really unfolding. And although the butterfly struggled, it was never able to fly. And what the man discovered afterwards was that it is in the struggle of getting out of the cocoon in pushing against what was happening in the wings, having to work hard to, to bring itself, if you will, to life, that the butterfly actually gains the strength, gets rid of the water that's burdening it down and is able to fly and become a butterfly. So when we think of our own lives, struggles happen, but struggles always teach us something. Most of you are old enough to be able to probably share struggles if you wanted to that you've had. And when you look back, you know that God has used those moments in our life to make us stronger, to make us smarter, to make us uh, have met people that helped us through. So the struggles of life are not always negatives. If we look at them and say to ourselves, what lesson will come out of this? We have a different view than how am I ever going to get through this? So I'll end it there, see if anybody has anything, they, any comments they want to add or any questions they want to ask. Uh, but know that what we're experiencing now is really in many ways a worldwide phenomena, but it doesn't have to have a negative impact on us. It doesn't have to bring us down, if you will, because we have ways to control it and to reach out and people who are right here on the Zoom call with you willing to help. So we'll see. see. Okay. There's a couple of a uh, couple of questions, and I think they they might be related in their answers. But here's the first one, <clears throat> sort of a question of balancing. How do you balance, or how do you find that good balance between spending time, you know, managing the stress that you have, so like doing things like you know, um, talking yep. to a friend, exercising, reading, etc., and then yep. spending time sort of directly dealing with or focusing on the issues that's causing your stress, right? Causing the stress. It's a great question because in a way you're right also that when we're doing the things that look after us, we actually are managing those things that are causing the stress. But I'll, I'll give an example. If I have a financial stressful issue, so I, I have to pay next month's rent and I don't have it or I don't have enough for it. Can't go to my parents because I already went to them three times and they said don't. Pay. So lots happening. But that stress now, what do I do first? I need to go speak to someone so I let it out, not let it internally um, uh, bother my body, my mind, and my spirit. So I talk to someone about the stress of someone that I can trust. That person in the conversation, or when I'm able to think more clearly, I might know where I could go. Can I go to someone at the school? Can I go to the financial office? Can I, you know, I have the solution to that situation. So that, that's, a, that's a tough one because finances are always hard. But oftentimes, we never really schedule things. We have seven days and we have 24 hours in a day and we have no more than that. So the experts say the very first thing we should do is start with sleep. I should get eight hours of sleep a day, so I'm taking seven times eight is 56. 56 hours are gone. What am I doing with the rest of them? Uh, because when we actually create a schedule – to make sure we have time to do the things we need, the exercise, the meeting up with friends, we actually accomplish more and we feel in control. So therefore we feel less stressed. So it's a challenging time, no, no doubt. I'm not suggesting it's not. But what we know from the research is, is that when we take the time to do those things that de-stress, we actually handle the stress better and we find the solutions easier, if that makes sense. What I'm hearing from you is that the answer is um, sort of twofold. One is um, don't underestimate how important it is to sort of take uh, perhaps a surprising amount of time ad hoc to yeah. get yeah. to the point where you can confront the stressful situation in a way that uh, your mind is engaged and your body is not stressed up. And then the second way of approaching it is sort of try to start building that into your life. 
of, yeah. um, you, you know, having that routine of, uh, you know, physical exercise, uh, good sleep, etc. cetera. Um, yep. Okay. And this is- And slow uh, but sure, slow but sure. You're not gonna do it all at once, that's for sure. Right, right. Uh, the question that I had, and I think it's sort of connected and, and perhaps you'll just reiterate the same answer, but the question that I <laughs> um, uh, had was this, you mentioned sort of um, making decisions about what you can do, you know, here and now to sort of reframe how you're approaching your life, right? And the stressors in your life. Right. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> you gave the example of, you know, uh, if you're bogged down in essays, uh, you know, you can email a prof. And that sort of made me think, what if, what if the action that you have to take to sort of reframe <laughs> your relationship with your own life is a stressful one, right? Like yeah, profs yeah. are, I mean, they aren't scary, but they are scary, right? When you're, yeah. when you're thinking about, oh, do I really go to this prof again to request an extension, right? That can itself be a stressor. So I'm stressed about my schoolwork and then what I need to do is stressful or, you know, I'm, yeah. uh, I think, man, I'm really stressed right now. I should start, I should work out, you know, I should de-stress my body. Oh no, I haven't exercised at all this week. And I said I was going to, and et cetera. So how do we, how do you manage that? <laughs> So, so those are great things because some of those we, you know, were kind of talked about, and I, I know I covered a lot in the, the the session. But first of all, we'd be gentle with ourselves because again, we can't change what we did. We want to try to exercise. Say we say we put three times a week instead of saying, okay, I'm going to do seven days a week. I haven't been doing it at all. I am saying I'm going to try three times this week, and if I don't get to the three, at least I did it once. Or can I ask a friend? Listen. I'm really shooting for three. So can you make me go for a walk with you? Help help me out here because that's what relationships do. So we draw other people in. That's the first thing. The second thing is the stressor of dealing with the stress. <laughs> this is true. But again, there's that quote. Sometimes we worry more about what's going to happen when I fall. What are they going to say? What's going to go on? Instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to rehearse what I'm going to say with a friend, someone I can trust. Um, talk to someone who's a trusted, if you will, um, person who can give me advice on this. Maybe someone, again, from the McMaster group here. You can go and you, they can say to you, listen, I think you should talk to the professor. What are you going to say? Sort of maybe you can rehearse it and then it's less scary to go in and say it. Or write your email that you're going to send and I'll look at it and let you know if, if I understood what you were asking before you send it. So there's ways to de-stress the stressor of the stress, if you will. Uh, and again, it all comes down to sort of those rules of, of looking after ourselves in the moment, of reaching out to other people, of not trying to manage things on our own, and of being gentle with ourselves. I have a friend who signs off every one of her emails to me, take a deep breath, Teresa, and count to five. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, sign off instead of take care, because it really does help. We know that that helps. We know that taking a moment to breathe in and breathe out and just feel the body helps. So it's important to reach out to people to help you with those things for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I'll take a moment here to say thank you again for coming and speaking with us.